I'm Evan Smith, the CEO of the Texas Tribune. On behalf of my colleagues at the Trib, I want to welcome you to this year's Texas Tribune Festival. Every one of the 11 years we've been in business, the work of our nonprofit newsroom has been critically important, but never more than in 2020. We produce reliable, credible reporting on issues that affect everyday Texans, making them better informed and motivating them to participate civically. You and people like you, readers, donors, attendees at our events, make that possible. This month, as part of our fall drive, we're hoping to sign up 500 new members. Go to texastribune.org slash give and support our efforts to create more thoughtful citizens through public service journalism. Now on with the show. I hope you enjoy this conversation between Washington Post media columnist Margaret Sullivan and legendary newsman Dan Rather. Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Rather, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Texas Tribune to the 2020 Texas Tribune Festival in my interview with Margaret Sullivan, one of the more important journalists in America today. We're here to talk about her new book, which has received rightfully so a great deal of attention, called Ghosting the News, Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy. Now, for those of you who do not know Ms. Sullivan and her work, let me briefly remind you uh, that she is now the media critic for the Washington Post. Before that, she was uh, the public editor of the New York Times, and before that was chief uh, editor of the Buffalo News. In fact, I think one time might have held those jobs simultaneously. A very experienced journalist. Ms. Sullivan was also a member of the Pulitzer Prize Board, and she served as director of the American Society of Newspaper Editors for two terms. It's good to see you again, Margaret. Let's get right to it. The name of the book is Ghosting the News, which is to say the death of news of local journalism and the crisis of American democracy. First of all, why did you write the book? Thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you very much for being here with me virtually, I guess we can say, in Austin. Um, and hello and welcome to everyone who's attending the, the Tribune Festival, a great event every year. I was, I was at the event in, in Austin last year, um, so um, this is a different experience, but uh, I'm sure a good one for everyone. That was the reason I, I wrote Ghosting the News was because I have such um, a tie, a strong tie to local journalism myself, and because I care about it so much, um, I was at the Buffalo News, which is my hometown paper, uh, for three decades, and I started there as a summer intern. Um, they hired me kindly at the end of the summer, and I hung around long enough uh, so that they eventually made me the chief editor, which, a job I did for 12 years. I, I really believe in local journalism. I've seen how important it is. And it's heartbreaking to me to see how much it has been weakened because the business model uh, for newspapers has been so destroyed in relatively recent years. So my aim in writing this book is to sound the alarm so that those who don't know that local journalism is in crisis can be aware and help solve the problem if possible. Well, the subtitle is the, uh, the crisis that this represents for American democracy. Now, question, would you say in retrospect that maybe that's too strong or not strong enough? Well, I, I think it's appropriate because my research um, in, in writing the book showed me that when local journalism fades in cities and communities, large and small, some things happen that are very unhealthy for democracy. For example, uh, and perhaps primarily, people become less politically engaged. Um, they vote uh, much more strictly along party lines rather than, you know, sort of considering the candidates and what they really stand for. Um, municipal costs go up because there isn't as much of a watchdog function. In other words, a lot of, a lot of bad things happen. Um, and when, you know, democracy is built on a, um, 
a situation in which citizens are well informed and when they become less well informed we really do have a crisis so um i i think it's true and uh and it's and it's a real worry well give us some some example what i'm looking for is i can't people get a, a sense of the size of this i mean we all know a lot of local newspapers have closed down but how many have closed down? I mean, is it 10%? Is it 15%? Is it 20% of local newspapers? Right. Or do we know? We do know. Um, we know uh, in part because of some work that's been done at the University of North Carolina um, by a woman named Penny Muse Abernathy, who's, who's a, a great researcher and a great professor there. Um, her work shows that since 2004, from 2004 to 2018, 2,000, more than 2,000 newspapers uh, went out of business. So that includes weeklies, but a number of dailies as well, a large number of dailies. And in some cases, the departure, the closing of these newspapers created what we call news deserts. So uh, that there really isn't, in some communities, in many communities across the United States now, there is no you know, solid, regular form of local news. And so people there are deprived of what they need to be good citizens. Now, um, since the coronavirus hit and the pandemic and the sort of um, economic fallout that followed it, this crisis has actually worsened because the remaining revenue that has supported newspapers has dwindled even more. So the closures of newspapers have continued and actually hastened during that time. So I was writing the book last year, things were bad enough. Um, then it got to be this spring and things got to be a whole lot worse. So, um, and you know, Dan, uh, as you know, because we've talked before, when we talk about local news, we clearly are not just talking about newspapers. You know, there are lots of other ways to get news, and I don't want to um, diminish them in any way. In fact, we're at the Texas Tribune Festival, and that is a great example of a new era, um, non-newspaper form of local news that's working very well. But my feeling is that newspapers are still Im very important within this whole media ecosystem. So, and they're the weakest link right now in terms of in terms of their financial well-being. Well, I do want to move to possible solutions as quickly as possible, because my experience, which I think matches you, is that people are interested in this problem once they understand what the problem is, but they are very interested in solutions or possible solutions. But before we do that, uh, what about that person who may be watching and listening to this or reads the book and says, well, no, I'm not so sure that it, it, it passed time for newspapers. After all, we have the, the great internet. We have local television uh, stations, and in some cases, radio stations. So, you know, why should I worry too much about newspapers? I, I, I'm still getting, a, getting a, a fair amount of local news over the internet and by radio and television. So I think that that is um, a real issue. I mean, particularly not just about local news, but people feel in general, wow, there's enough news out there. In fact, I'd like to tune it all out. Um, it's coming mm -hmm. at me like a fire hose and I would like to take a break from it. So please don't tell me there's not enough news. Um, and in fact, I think that that is true on a national and even global level. There's a lot of news to be found um, on the internet and from on and from news sources that are continuing to do well, like my paper, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, these places are still not only making it, but, but thriving. But my book and my concern is about what happens in cities as large as, for example, Chicago, Miami, um, Buffalo, Cleveland, and in small towns where the sort of, you know, much more granular local news, the coverage of city councils, the coverage of environmental issues, the coverage of the virus, in fact, has dwindled so much because, and this is another 
statistic I'll just toss out there. In newsrooms, not just newspaper newsrooms, but in local newsrooms across the country in that same period of time I talked about, employment is down by more than half. So we've really lost a lot of the people who were out uh, you know, gathering the news and bringing it to their communities. And that's, that's at the root of the problem. So people may say, I've got enough news, but what kind of news is it, is, is the question I would ask. Yes. I was turning away, Margaret, because the fax machine was going off. I didn't want to override what you said. But I want to hold with this for just a moment, because anybody who knows anything about the news business knows that one of the most important functions of, of news coverage, and particularly local and state news coverage, is the watchdog role, which is to say a, a, a journalist representing the public at large attends city council meetings, all those boring zoning hearings where uh, if one isn't careful, a lot of corruption and cheating goes on. State legislatures, uh, the coverage of state legislatures we know has, uh, has shrunk to, to the point now where uh, it's rare that there's real coverage of state legislatures. So that being the case, what is there, is there any way to finance that kind of journalism and have it on a day-to-day, -day, week in, year in, year out basis without having a local newspaper? Yes, I think, I think there are um, cases like that. And I think we see that in Texas and in Austin um, because not only do we have the Texas Tribune, which is, is such a good organization, but now uh, it has joined forces with one of the premier investigative news organizations in the country, ProPublica, and they are working together to do this. Um, similarly, there's an organization in Pennsylvania called Spotlight PA, in which the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, local TV and radio stations and, and digital outfits have come together to beef up the state coverage that you just mentioned, because this sort of state house coverage is one of the places that is, is most important, because that's where a lot of our tax dollars are, and where a lot of political shenanigans can take place if nobody's watching the store. So, the, you know, we are seeing these collaborative efforts that are very encouraging. Um, you know, my feeling is, we need to encourage those kinds of organizations and support them with our with our dollars and our attention, um, while also I hope shoring up some of the legacy organizations that are still doing such great work. Well, now let's move heavily into well, we we see the problem. What can be done about it? Let's talk about solutions. Now we are appearing at the, uh, you know. The, this festival, which is put on by the Texas Tribune, we've talked about the Tribune, and we know that the Tribune is, uh, you know, really burst through with, at when it first started, a kind of one of the time, one of a kind answer to this. What do we do about the need for local news? And John Thornton, who had a great deal to do with raising the money and deserves a lot of credit, and of course Evan Smith took an editorial in a strong direction. But is the Texas Tribune a model that we could, we could expect? that could be duplicated on a widespread basis, or is it pretty much one of a kind? It's, I guess I would say, Dan, I mean, you've outlined the, the problem well with that question. Um, I would say that it's, it's, neither, it's at neither extreme. It's not one of a kind, nor is it easy to bring it to scale um, to replace newspapers that are fading or dying. I think that, you know, there are other nonprofit news organizations, digital only for the most part, that have cropped up all over the country. Um, you know, Voice of San Diego is one, Min Post is another. In Buffalo, there's one called Investigative Post. In New York City, there's one called The City. And they are really helping to fill the gap. They're funded largely by membership and philanthropy, so not through advertising the way newspapers have traditionally been funded. You know, is it possible to put one of those in every place that a newspaper has died? I, I don't think that's actually, it hasn't happened yet, that's for sure. And it is difficult to make it scale the way it needs to, to really have a healthy local journalism uh, system uh, happening. And, you know, in, as you know, and I think we've talked about this too, 
in many communities, the newspaper has kind of been the engine for local news. So local TV can often do a good job and they do enterprise and investigative work and they do good stuff. Uh, local radio, particularly public radio, has started to fill the gap. But newspapers are still, according to Duke University, in a study I cite in my book, even now in their withered state, they're still doing most of the original local work. And so I don't like to hear people say, well, that ship has sailed, simply move on. I think we have to encourage the new and shore up the old um, and, and kind of hope for the best because it's, it's actually a, a pretty tough situation in a lot of ways. Well, as I, as I know that you know, and I think many people know, uh, that while I started in print with a wire services and small weekly newspaper and made my way up a little bit in newspaper business, I spent most of my time in television news. And I'm proud of much of what television news does, particularly at the, at the network level, but a lot of local stations. But it is a fact that in terms of long, the kind of investigative reporting, which is deep digging, and takes weeks, maybe months, and sometimes even longer, and requires an investment, an investment that may, when you get to the end of the road, you don't find the story's not there to pay off. It's very expensive. I Frankly, I don't see how we can have that kind of reporting, the deep digging, long range investigative pieces, without newspapers being the spine of it. But now, do you share that view or are organizations such as the Texas Tribune and some of these other new things that have come about capable of doing that kind of investigative reporting? Oh, I think they are capable of doing it and they are doing it. Um, it for me, the problem there is not, are they capable of it? Do they have the reporting strength and the skill and all of that? It's a question of, can there be enough of it in every community to to sort of fill the gap. Um, and when I look around the country and I traveled around the country to, to do this book, um, the answers weren't particularly encouraging in a lot of places. I'll give you one example. Um, I went to Youngstown, Ohio, where the 150 year old Vindicator went out of business last summer. So it was announced last July, just about a year ago, that it was gonna close its doors and it was going to do so very quickly in August. So now it's been it's been shut down for about a year. Okay, what has come up in its wake? Well, some things have come up, and it's not it's not a completely bleak picture. It's true the newspaper is gone, but there's a neighboring uh, city that has put out um, that puts out a daily edition that includes some Youngstown news. There's a new digital organization funded by McClatchy, the newspaper chain, along with Google, that's called Mahoning Matters. Mahoning is the county around Youngstown. Um, there's a TV station that has, um, that has a reporter, I think this is right, uh, a reporter from ProPublica there. I know that ProPublica has sent a reporter into Youngstown. I think it's at a TV station. So, you know, this is all, this is all good. Uh, but the, the Youngstown Vindicator had a 44-member newsroom, and um, I think Mahoning Matters has four reporters. So, you know, it just doesn't quite get there, um, despite talent and best intentions and, you know, good things happening. It's still a work in progress. That doesn't mean that someday they won't be at that level, but I don't think they're there yet. And that is true in many places. And, you know, even, I think even more dire are places that have lost their weekly newspapers. So that, you know, you might say, well, a weekly, what do they do? They don't, they're not doing big investigative stories. But boy, they are really important to their communities and they do important journalism. And when they go away, it's very unlikely, I think, that they are all going to, you know, that these relatively small towns are going to find, you know, a very robust startup digital organization to really fill the gap. I mean, I'd like to think so, and it is happening in some places, but again, I think, can it be widespread enough? For those of you who may have just joined us in progress, 
Uh, I'm Dan Rather. I'm talking to Margaret Sullivan, who's the author of the new book, Ghosting the News, Local Journalism in the Crisis um, of American Democracy. Margaret, to someone who may be listening to this and saying, not having their head in approval, but saying, what can I do as just a member of the community as a quote, ordinary citizen, and quote, what can I do besides maybe subscribe to whatever is the closest newspaper and keep the subscription current? What, if anything, can such people do? Well, I mean, that's a great first step. If, if, uh, if you haven't done it, I think it's really important to both subscribe to your local newspaper and to support organizations that are new, like the ones we've been talking about. If you can do both, uh, it's, it's great. And I know people feel like, well, this isn't a great economic time for me and I'm cutting corners. Um, and I would mm -hmm. hope that that's seen as a kind, I think that it's a necessity and that it ought to be high on the list of priorities, um, places that we spend our money. You know, one of the things I heard from people sadly was, well, I used to appreciate my local paper, but it's not what it was. And it's, you know, the staff has been cut and now it's owned by a hedge fund and I don't want to help those hedge funders out. So I'm not going to subscribe anymore. And I would argue the other side of that, which is what you're actually supporting, or I would like to hope and, and pray that you're supporting is the journalists and the journalism that are still doing their best and very gamely trying to do the job. So that's one thing you can do, both contribute and subscribe. And then I think you can be an engaged citizen who's actually seeking um, verifiable and accurate information and, you know, talking to your public officials and talking to the, you know, writing a letter to the editor, being in the mix and being engaged. Um, it actually works both ways. Yes, the news organizations need to bring you the information, but you, you need to sort of do something with it and be an engaged citizen and seek out good information and let your public officials, your elected officials know that this is something important to you because there's actually a lot of legislation that's being considered right now that could help news organizations thrive. And in order for that to happen, uh, public officials have to know that it's important to their constituents. Margaret, I asked you coming into this interview, a version of this, but now let me use not one, but two cliches, if you will. Realistically, what are the chances that despite your best efforts, despite your passion for this and your deep research and what you've done with the book, that actually you're kind of whistling through the graveyard, that newspapers are going, going, gone, it's only a matter of time. Or if you prefer the other cliche, that newspapers are a little like uh, in the mafia, sometimes a person is dead, but he doesn't know it yet. It's a so-called <laughs> right. walking corpse. Right. Realistic right. what we're dealing with here is a walking corpse. Well, that's true for, for many, for many uh, newspapers. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett, who owned the Buffalo News for a long time, said that newspapers were once a monopoly and then they got to be a franchise. And now he said they're toast. Uh, and he sold his newspapers last year, including the Buffalo News. Um, and, you know, there have been plenty of others who've said that, including Dean Baquet at the, at the New York Times, who says that he thinks that within five years, all but a very few, those, for example, who have a billionaire owner who's with the kind of deep pockets and commitment that who's willing to sort of fund a newspaper, he thinks that they'll all be gone. So those are some pretty smart people. Um, and perhaps it's um, naive of me to think that that's not necessarily true, but I do think it's not necessarily true. But it's going to take, it's going to take, you know, citizens, I guess we can call them news consumers, but I prefer to think of them as citizens to sort of make it happen and to help. They don't have to save it all by themselves, but they have to help. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to uh, alert people to, because I think that if you lose that in your city, in your community, you're really losing something extremely important. Margaret, we're near the end now, and I want to give you an opportunity here as we end to make one more swing by twice 
somebody should read this book, why a lot of somebody should read this book, Ghosts in the News. Well, the thing that I thought was so interesting when I first started researching it was that was that even though we in journalism know that local news is under siege, you know, financially, um, and that news is under siege in other ways, um, politically, most people, you know, the people who responded to a Pew Research study thought that local journalism was actually doing fine. Seventy some percent thought that it was doing fine financially, and only fourteen percent were paying for any form of local news. Well, that's a really bad combination. You think it's fine without you, and you're not helping. So my effort here is to say, no, it's not doing fine. It's actually really in trouble. And you, citizen, you, news consumer, have a role in making things better. So um, it's intended to be an alarm bell as much as anything, Dan. And I hope that I hope that people will pay attention and that they will open their wallets and that they will talk to their public officials and be as engaged as possible so that, you know, we can continue to be the kind of informed electorate that we need to to keep the democracy working the way it's supposed to. Thank you very much. Margaret Sullivan, who is the chief editor, was the chief editor of the Buffalo News and is uh, now with the Washington Post, with the media columnist. Her book is Ghosting the News, Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy. I'm Dan Rather with Margaret Sullivan for the Texas Tribune and the Texas Tribune Festival. See you along the trail.